Uh, this is the Montreal session. Dirk from Montreal. So, uh, welcome to. Uh, this is this is going to be a bilingual session. Also, I have some quotes in French. I'll translate them as I go along. Um, believe it or not, Dirk and I don't discuss these things. <laughs> We actually don't have time to meet in Montreal. We meet in Paris. Uh, but there, there are very, uh, as you'll see, there are connections between our talks. Uh, I'm not using its framework, but you'll see how it might fit in. Uh, but I'm also fully pulling the threads in a different direction. So I'm sort of a thinking out of the box somehow. Um, and this is somewhat reckless of me. Thinking of the theme of this conference, I could have talked about other things, uh, as you know, and it's very rich. Um, I could have talked like, so we'll say a few words about this later, because I, I did publish about the abstract, something about the abstract method. Uh, but also I could have talked about the methods of sketches as a, as a way of presenting theories uh, that is used by category theorists. But I don't think that would have been a success, so I preferred not to do that. And see, my here is better place than I actually talk about this. So I decided to do this thing. This thing is very work in progress. Uh, so you can challenge me. I'll welcome that. I may be wrong. Uh, if I am, then I'll learn something. Hopefully, it's not pointless, which would be the worst thing. Uh, but we'll see. Subtitle. This is an homage to Alexander Grotendieck, who died in last November, uh, was here in Paris, uh, worked and changed the face of algebraic geometry and mathematics in general. Uh, he's playing a central role in what I'm talking about here. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of his stuff and his students. Uh, and it's going to be very, very sketchy. And I apologize for this, but I need to do it. So I need to do it that way in some way. All right, so we've heard about axiomatization, and I agree with uh, Dirk on the various things. So the first thing is that, well, axioms have different functions. Dirk has pointed out a lot of them. Uh, so I'm not using his framework and know it very well and well enough to use it here, but I could have, had, I could have done that. So conceptual analysis, we are all familiar with that and use that. Logical analysis, of course, uh, in the 20th, early 20th century, and people, the American oscillationists, developed this school, and then it became sort of a standard tool in philosophy and foundations of mathematics. That's fine. Uh, abstraction here, uh, this is another talk I gave. Um, so if you look at Van der Waalen's work, and he talks about the abstract method, and that became the central, one of the central tools in algebra and topology and everything. In it. 20s and 30s, and it is very often identified with axiomatization, uh, whereas, in fact, it's not the same at all. Uh, but this is a very important thing that was done in the 1930s and afterwards, even today, it's thought about as playing this role. And others. So, yes, Dirk pointed out to others, and I want to look at something that is going in the same direction. Uh, you'll see, I'll sort of frame things in a different way. Okay. So the case study that I want to look at is uh, Kotendieck and, and Verzi, uh, one of the students in the 60s. And I'll talk a little bit about what they were doing, how they did it, and I'll sort of explain a few things. But again, I want to apologize. This is going to be very, 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 very rough. Okay. So as some of you might know, uh, when Grotendieck started to work, he worked in functional analysis, and then he didn't know what to do for a year, basically. And Sai just pointed out to him, said, oh, oh here's something you might like to work on. Uh, it's the bio conjectures. Uh, and so he said, wow, this, this is very interesting. That's a challenging problem, so I'll, I'll do that. And then I revolutionized mathematics on the way. Uh, well, just to do these things seems to be very interesting thing to do. So what is what are the vile conjectures? I won't explain them in very precise terms here, but just to give you the, the context. So very roughly, so the problem is very simple in some sense. It's when you start looking at the details, it becomes, it becomes very, very complicated. So it's just to find a way to count the number of solutions to a system of poly, polynomial, polynomial equations. So we don't have to do that, but over finite fields. So that's where things get a little mod p. So, so 
So this is then you mix things together like Gauss and Riemann, and things get really, really complicated. So it is a, vari a variation of finite fields of a Riemann set hypothesis, which is of a complex field, and that's, this itself has a long and interesting history. So this is also sort of, you take the Riemann hypothesis on complex field and you transfer it over the finite fields. And you want to prove that for the finite field, the hope I guess, is that if you can do it for the finite fields and you understand how to do it, perhaps you can transfer the methods over the complex fields. Perhaps, you don't know, you want to really look at it. Uh, Viley himself had proved versions of the Riemann's hypothesis for curves over finite fields. This was very important work. Recognized as such in the 30s and 40s by his contemporaries. And his books, his book, sorry, Foundations of Algebraic Geometry, uh, was written to set the theory to make the foregoing proofs rigorous and to prove versions of the hypothesis for higher dimensional varieties over finite fields. So you have it for curves, you want to do it for surfaces or n dimensional objects over finite fields. And in order to do that, Weil realized that he had to rewrite algebraic geometry, and he tried to do it, and he published Foundations of Algebraic Geometry. It didn't quite work, okay? But at least he tried that. So I want to explain this, okay? So this is the zeta, the zeta function on a variety over a finite field. It looks like this, okay? So you have a, a finite field, Q is a power of a prime, so, and you can take the plane of this, and so your quotient over, and this is a polynomial that takes, this is a, 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 a sum, an infinite sum of certain powers. And you have to, this is a function, you want to prove properties of that. Okay, so they know how to express this, and this is the important, you know how to express this in a clear and rigorous way in the context of finite fields, so this is fine. And you have these properties. So the details here are not, important. For me here, what is important is that people knew okay, what they were looking for in a very precise manner. So they knew that this function, they wanted to prove that it was a rational function, which meant this. So you have these polynomials of a certain kind and expressed this way. And they had integer, integer coefficients and the blah, blah, blah. Then you have the functional equations, you know how they are expressed also again. Here, this is very interesting because when you talk about Begin numbers, you're in topology. Okay, so now this is polynomials, functions over finite fields, and suddenly you want to introduce notions of topology, and you realize that, whoa, how am I going to do this? This is a discrete stuff. Finite fields are very discrete objects. You want to use topological ideas. How on hell are you going to do this thing? So this is a challenge, but file pushes it in that direction. And then when Saya comes in, he says, look. And Gotenberg himself says in his, his memoir, the Picardi Sanai, he says, if, if Saya had not used these terms, I would not have been interested. But he knew how to hook me. Okay? So he translated all these conjectures in terms of cohomology. Cohomology. And that potent get right. And so Sass says, look, we could prove these conjectures if we could construct a certain cohomology theory that has certain properties. So if we can do that, then we can prove conjectures. Okay, so prove this as well. Okay, that sounds interesting. And it came from the picture that one gets of the conjectures in the case of the complex field. And you transfer that to the case of finite fields. It's, of course, the complex field is a very specific field with all kinds of beautiful properties, topological and all that. And you want to transfer that to finite fields. Again, I want to insist on this, because Gautendick was very, very proud of that. The fact that you have to mix in in a unified framework, the continuous and the discrete. And these are classical uh, distinctions, and they go back to sort of a categorical mistake. This is continuous, this is the discrete, with different categories. And Kotinger comes in and says, okay, and 
not him, but he, he succeeds in doing this, and he says it himself. I was able to do this very, through certain of my ideas, and I won't discuss those here, but I was able to do that. And he himself said, that's a revolution. So I did something. <laughs> All right. Sire himself, uh, when he started to uh, explain these things to what he did, he tried to develop a cosmology theory, uh, tried to prove certain things. It worked to some extent. It's very interesting work that gave him the conviction that it was feasible, and that's why he turned to Cotton and said, "Well, perhaps you can try that too." All right. Here's Cotton Personne n'avait la moindre idée comment définir une telle cohomologie. Et je ne suis pas sûr que personne d'autre que ça et moi, pas même d'ailleurs, si ça se trouve, avait seulement l'intime conviction que ça devait exister. So, roughly in English, no one had any idea of how to define this cohomology theory. And I'm not even sure that Weil himself knew how to do it. Okay, so, it's simply impossible to but, and this is an important point, what was clear to Saev and Potentier very early on is they knew what the theory had to satisfy. So they handled this, and I'll give those to you. Of things that the theory had to satisfy. I won't explain them to you. So Potentier in at the ICM meeting, the International uh, IMC Mathematical Congress in 1958, and that was published in 1960. So in that paper, he presents what the cohomology theory thought has, has to satisfy. And he gives very clear criteria, and he explains how he's going to do it. He already had a lot of stuff going on, and he's pretty confident that he's going to succeed, and he did So a vi cohomology, like any, any cohomology, is just a functor okay, from a certain object to, usually these are groups, okay, or modules, or objects of an algebraic kind, and these are varieties that you want to work on. And here's the list of things that you want your theory to satisfy. So, for instance, it has to be finite. All of these modules have to be uh, finite dimensional vector spaces over a finite field. A point guy is the other thing that you have to expect. I didn't write them, the formulas down. It's pointless here. I'm not going to explain to you how point guy is the is expressed in these terms. But it, it's, it's, so they, they did know, they did find out how to express it. As certain formulas on, on tensors and stuff like that. As the list goes on, he had to have the cohomology class of a cycle, and then what is called the weak left shift theorem, the hard left shift theorem, the left shift trace formula, and the Riemann hypothesis. These are not independent by them. Okay? So if you have this, then you can prove a whole lot of the others. And they knew that. So the details here for me are not important. What you have to keep in mind are the constraints. So they're going there. They're looking for something that will satisfy these. As I, as I said, nobody knew how. And that was a challenge. So they set up the work. All right. So as I said, the conditions are not independent. And Rotinik's fundamental idea was to transpose the methods of homological algebra to algebraic geometry. OK, this is a bit crazy uh, in a sense. So homological algebra was a very new field. So the first book was by Eilenberg and Cartan in 1950, early 50s. Uh, Rotendieck himself published a very, very important paper in 1957, work he had done in 1955. It's called the Tohoku paper, because it was published in uh, a Japanese journal, the Tohoku journal, uh, in which he rewrites homological algebra, using category theory in a different way, and then rewrites all the machinery of homological algebra. And he already has this in mind, but these are just the first steps towards how this is going to develop. And this amounts to finding a way to unify, as I said, the continuous and the discrete. So, uh, parenthesis. This unification is done via the idea of a topos. <laughs> and this is where you have an idea of a space 
that has at the same time continuity, but it, it, all the properties you can apply to the discrete varieties, algebraic varieties. All right, but I won't talk about that. And of course, categories played a uh, central role in the whole enterprise in the program, uh, right from the start. <coughs> so this is very interesting in itself, but I don't know how aggressive. Okay, here's a long quote that I'll read in English, uh, in French, and then translate uh, because I'm setting up the, the where I'm getting at. Pour comprendre la révolution qui a constitué l'introduction des catégories dérivées, il faut se replacer en 1960. À cette époque, l'algèbre homologique est déjà très développée. Pourtant, Grotendieck se rend compte que ce formalisme est nettement insuffisant pour ce qu'il envisage de faire. Au moment d'entreprendre la rédaction d'ensemble de ses résultats, il s'aperçoit que, ne serait-ce que pour formuler les énoncés qu'il a en tête, il manque des outils. Il conçoit alors une nouvelle théorie des foncteurs dérivés, conduisant à une refonte complète de l'algèbre homologique. Ça, c'est une uh, citation de Yiduzi, one of his students. So, roughly in English, uh, to understand the revolution that, that constituted the introduction of derived categories, you have to go back in the 60s, uh, where homological algebra was already very developed, but Grotendieck realizes that the formalism is clearly insufficient for what he wants to do. So when he writes down what he the setups and the results he wants to prove, he realizes that he cannot even formulate what he has in mind, and he doesn't have the tools for that. He then conceives a new theory of derived functors that yields a completely new uh, foundation of homological logic. All right. So Goldendick proposes to one of his students, uh, Jean-Louis Verdier, to pursue some of his ideas as to how to construct the derived functor, so these things he want to <laughs> use, which are now the building block of homological algebra and its application to algebraic geometry. All right, so we get now to the real meat, the substance of, the mathematical substance of the talk. Verdier um, does develop these ideas, that's his PhD thesis, and at the center of the stage, one finds the notion of a triangulated category. So that's just what I want to talk about. And he axiomatizes that. Okay. I'll give you, <laughs> this is crazy, the axioms of a triangulated category. All right. So, terminology. So we all think of these as maps. We have objects. The sigma x is, of course, built from x. It's called a translation of x. And this is called a triangle. Okay. <laughs> this is called a triangle. There's no triangle here. Well, there is one in a sense, if you can think of it that way, where you would have y and z, and you can put whoops, sigma x on top. And you have a colon like this. So this is a triangle, and you go over. Okay. And in fact, the sigma x is sort of pulling x on top of x. It's a square. Yeah. Well, now it's a tetrahedron. <laughs> That's not even a square. It's not a triangle. <laughs> now it's not a square because you think you put you pull the sigma x over x, okay. so to speak, but it's over. Okay. Then at the bottom you have a triangle. <clears throat> there are other reasons, but okay, roughly well, yeah, that's just terminology. So it's bizarre at first, but when you're in the field. It does make sense to me. So here's the, the definition. A triangulation of a, on an additive, additive category. So what is an additive category? It doesn't matter. So this is also defined axiomatically. Is an additive self-equivalence. Think of this as a, an orthomorphism. So it takes the category it sends to itself. It's a translation. Uh, these objects are, in fact, I write, we write x, but you have to think that x is, in fact, a chain complex. It's, it's a huge thing. It's an infinite thing. And sigma takes it and just translates it. Pull, it just pushes the degrees of the construction by one, for instance. So you can have this automorphism together with a collection of triangles called distinguished triangles, such that the following axioms hold. The details are not important. But, so let x be an object and f of x be any map in the category. This specific triangle is distinguished. Any map 
this part of his distinction, the district yeah. distinguished triangle. And this is a very powerful axiom. Any triangle isomorphic, isomorphic to a distinguished triangle is distinguished. This is a technical axiom, so to speak. If this is a triangle, it is distinguished, and so is something that is built from it, fine. This does not matter. The real axiom is this one. Okay. Uh, this is not Verzi's axiom, by the way. This is by May, and given only in 2005. Uh, Niemann uh, pointed to it in the 90s. It's a different way of looking at it. I wish I had had the time to present this dynamically. Okay, you see a big picture, but in fact, it has to be read as something that is filled. Okay, so what you're given are these triangles here. You have another one here, like this. Okay, and then you have, if you look, you have this, these are commutative triangles, not triangles in the sense of we just said, you have a, a triangle here in the technical sense of the definition. Then you have another triangle here in the technical sense of the notion. And finally, you have a, a third triangle. Uh, let's see, where is it? Here, that is in principle given, but it can be filled in. What the axiom says is if you have these commutative gadgets, and there's another one here with the J's, then the H and these fill in and gives you what is called a grade. Okay. So if you were to look at dynamically, you would have certain things that are given, and then what the axiom says is you can fill in the diagram, and it has certain properties. Okay. Look at the language. Arrows are prominent here and very powerful. You can look at that and visualize it. If I were to write it down like this, it would be a mess to understand. Okay? If you look at the diagram, it's a very beautiful diagram, very symmetric, and it's it really easy to understand how you fill it in. Okay? And that's what the axiom says. All right. Before anybody asks, so this is a notion of a triangulated pattern. It comes in, it comes in, in Berthier's work. It plays a, come back to that, crucial role in his work in Gautier's enterprise. And say, oh, you're looking only at this special case. Well, no. Uh, this kind of axiomatization is really everywhere in a categorical framework. You have Cohen model categories, for instance, which are really important nowadays in homotopy. You have differential graded categories, which are also very important in different fields, not only in homotopy. You have Waldhausen categories in K-theory and other areas also in algebra. And I could go on like this. You have Fulbenius categories that are also important in representation theory, and many others. And there are somehow, there are some links between them also, but my point here is that, okay, I will be talking about triangulated categories, but you could use any one of these to make the same point that I'm making here, okay? That's what I, why I mentioned this. All right, so what's the point? Why do, why would anybody introduce such a thing as triangulated categories? And to be honest with you, a lot of mathematicians thought that when Berthier published his thesis and when Berthier pushed it. Uh, a lot of people thought, why on earth would you do that? Okay. And here's how Verdier himself justifies um, the introduction of triangulated categories. Uh, he introduces the plan of his book, and he says, in this, uh, au paragraph 2, nous montrons dans le cadre général des catégories triangulées que le problème consiste à inverser formellement les quasi-isomorphismes de la catégorie triangulée cas de A, se résout simplement, that's the important part, par un calcul des fractions. Le paragraphe 3, nous démontrons un théorème du Afraïd, une catégorie triangulée D se plonge de manière universelle dans une catégorie abélienne A. So, 
two things that he mentions here. The first thing is that there's simplicity at work. If you introduce these guys, then you can do things in a much simpler way. Moreover, there's a result that I can prove that is already known, which is a universal uh, uh, embedding, so to speak, that you get in this case. Okay? Uh, someone could have done all he did without introducing triangulated categories as an object, as something. There's a choice there, taking, this is a, an important notion, important enough so that I will axiomatize it and I'll do work with it. And that's what it does for me, but it does more. Okay. All right. The claim, so you would have to look at the details, but I want the claims that I, I hope are somewhat intuitively clear to you right now, although I have some doubts about that. Uh, or believe me when I say that. <laughs> The notion of a triangulated category is not a systematic organization of a field. It's not as if, and there are cases in story. And if you look at the uh, Eilenberg and Steenrod's book on foundations of algebraic topology, when they, in the introduction, they, they say, well, right now, the whole field of algebraic topology is a mess. You have Czech who does things this way, and then you have Vitoris who does things this way, and no one really knows whether they're doing the same thing or not. And then you have these other ways, Poincaré suggested this way, and no one knows exactly how it works and what a homology theory is. And, and then they say, well, we'll clarify it. And in this book, now we'll tell you what a homology theory ought to be. Okay, so they really organize the whole field, and then they say in the chapter, now I will show you that what Chuck and Vitoris are doing are exactly the same over these classes of spaces. Here's the theory. Okay? That's not what it's doing, it's going on here. It's certainly not a logical analysis, so Verti is not trying to not, not analyze certain axioms, prove independence and stuff like that, completeness. That's not what he has in mind. And it's not a conceptual analysis that I hope at all either. So he's not trying to prove that in this case, if you axiomatize, you can have the first group of axioms will give you this, the second group will give you that, and the third one is a different thing altogether. That's not what he's doing that either. Okay. And he's not, this is a final point that is important, he's not using the abstract method, uh, So Noether did bring theory. She introduces, well, the axioms existed before her, but when she introduces the axioms for what we now call Neurotherian rings, she uses the axioms to prove things, and there are some ver benefits from that. In, in a, uh, and these, I don't know whether you mentioned these, but simplicity is one of them, but also unification is a really important gain there that she, but he's not unique doing that, it's not, if you read Verzi's thesis, he's not saying, okay, look, we have this, in this area we have this phenomenon going on, in this area we have this other phenomenon going on, and in this third area we have another phenomenon, sort of look alike, but they're not exactly apparently the same, but if I axiomatize a certain no notion this way, abstract, then you'll realize that these are cases, models would call them, of these axioms. But now I can prove things from the axioms, and all the proofs will be valid in all these different cases. This is the abstract method. And that's not what Verzier is saying. He's not saying, look, I realize that in this, as this part of homological algebra we have this, and in the other part we have that. And I will produce axioms so that I will unify. That's not what he's doing. He's not saying that at all. So what 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 you doing? All right. Where this is where I shift. <laughs> so the claim I will try to very sketch here, very roughly, is that one way to think, this is one way to think about it, is that it was a form of conceptual design. Okay, so they were trying to design something that would allow them to do something. Okay. And this is one way of thinking about it. It's not, oh, I'll capture this notion. Oh, I'm doing a logical analysis. Oh, I'm trying to organize this thing. No. So I, have, I need this. I need something. I need something that will do that. Oh, 
that might work. How, how is it? So here, here's the thing I want to do, and here's why it would work. So this claim, uh, it can be understood in two ways. There's a weak claim, and well, of course, there's a strong claim. That was surprise. Okay, and this is this claim here. Okay, so if I'm saying this, there are two ways of understanding what I'm saying. I want to be clear about what I'm actually claiming. Um, the weak claim, it is useful, but it's not what I'm aiming at. So there's an analogy between what these mathematicians have done and cases of generic design. And what I mean, what I mean by generic design is design. Architects, engineers, and others who do design. Engineers, that's what they do. They design processes. Architect, they draw blueprints for something. They design it. And that's the usual sense. That was your first slide. Yeah, precisely. Got that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I think there's an analogy here. And I think it is useful. Okay, but I want to be, I, I want to go to for the whole thing. I want to be bold. So perhaps I'll be dead. But the strong claim, there is such a thing that should be called conceptual. And these pieces of mathematics are an instance. Okay? Uh, this is a very strong claim. You'll see why in a minute. Um, it's probably suicidal, but you won't be it once. <laughs> so let's try it. This conceptual design is either a particular case of generic design, or it might even, or even uh, underlie cases of generic design. I'm not quite clear about this, by the way, and you'll see why in a few moments. Um, so the first case is that there would be something that underlies all cases of design, like architects and engineers and mathematicians, and it might be called conceptual design. Okay. Or the reverse. Generic design has certain properties. What I'm looking at is only a specific case of it. And if you start thinking about it, you realize that when you think of generic design, well, you think about real things. Okay. Uh, and of course, when I'm talking about conceptual design, I'm not talking about real things. I'm talking about concepts. And so can you carve concepts? It doesn't make any sense. But in a sense that I will specify there's something going on that I think that is at work. Okay. And, and I'll, in the literature, there are, there are instances of people who thought that that might be also reasonable. All right, so I have to tell you a little bit about what design is and how I understand it. Otherwise, it's just everything goes. So what is generic design is the, the way I want to understand it. So we look at narrow definition, for instance, to see if we can uh, find something to start with. Uh, some of the definitions you might find is a general arrangement of the different parts of something that is made, such as a building, book, machine, etc. So you think of, of these things and general arrangements. Okay. Another definition that you will find is the art or process of deciding how something will look, work, by drawing plans, making models, etc. So these are the architects, these are the engineers, and they design. That's what they do. Last one, a drawing or plan from which something may be made. All right, so this is pretty clear. We all have instances in mind of what a narrow definition of design might give. But there, if you look at the literature on design, there are some broader no notion, broader definitions. And I'll give you a few. The one, this one is by the Design Council. I don't know what that is, <laughs> it's the Design Council. And they say in their, in their official papers, <laughs> design could be viewed as an activity that translate, translates an idea into a blueprint for something useful. OK, that's very broad. <laughs> but all right, you can read this in. Oh, that's interesting. Another broad definition by a designer himself who studied, uh, who uh, one of the main thinkers of design in the 1960s. Uh, and he writes this. 
It is based on the idea that every design problem begins with an effort to achieve fitness between two entities, the form in question and its context. The form is the solution to the problem. The context design defines, sorry, the problem. In other words, when we speak of design, the real object, oh, there's a, a novel about the real object of objects, it's not this is one, is not the form, the real object of design, that's what you should be, is not the form alone, but the ensemble comprising the form and its context. Okay. This is very broad, but you understand also that you might start to think where I'm going and why I'm doing this. Here, there's a fitness between two entities, question and its context. There are constraints. You have to take these constraints into account. Engineers and architects deal with these constraints all the time. It's their bread and butter. They have to. That's why I started this talk with talking about constraints. Constraints for a vehicle homology were really clear and understood to everybody, or at least two people. <laughs> and they had to build something that would satisfy them. And they really thought about it as building a theory that would satisfy these constraints. Whether that was possible or not, that was the question. Okay. All right, so very, very roughly, and I wouldn't bet my life on it. So I would sort of define, characterize in the first instance, and I would have to think more about this, but very much. I would say that the conceptual design is a way of organizing concepts in a certain form. And here I would specify an inner language. Okay, oh, you'll see why I, would, I have to add that in a minute. In such a way that the form given to these concepts is used crucially in the solution of a set of problems. All right, as I said, this is a very, very rough first attempt at trying to capture what I mean by this way of thinking here. And it sort of works for the case I have in mind, but I don't know whether it holds any water in the In all cases of design, conceptual or not, one has the following three interrelated components that are inherent in the design. And this is true. I mean, if you think of, if you talk to someone who is doing this, and they'll, they'll say, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, we, we have to think about this. You have the properties of the user. You have to take that into account when you design an object or a building. What do people will do? Every architect knows that for every bathroom, you have to have at least n square meters. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, that's the minimum. If you design a building, you have to... So it's really well, except in Paris. Exactly. <laughs> well, that design is something, too. Okay? And we'll get to that point in a minute. Then you have properties of the object design. Also, you have to take into account that will be uh, crucial to what you want to do. And the properties of the context in which the object is supposed to be I mean, here, suppose, because, of course, that will vary after a while. So we have these three dimensions that have to be taken into account when you design something, right? And this is known by everybody and assumed by everyone doing this kind of work. Now, in this particular case that I'm interested in, what I put here, of course, there are cognitive constraints, but I don't want to emphasize this. In the case of Gordon and the others, uh, the user here is the language chosen, uh, the category theory, and the symbolism chosen, these diagrams, are very important. Uh, if you look at the paper by Allenberg and McLean, the founding paper on category theory, there are very, very few diagrams. There's a square, commutative squares of natural transformations. It's very simple. The diagram you saw earlier is something very nice, and th this was developed afterwards by Allenberg and Carta and Allenberg and Steenrod in Foundations of Algebra Topology, then suddenly you find this, these large diagrams and they say, look, the proof amounts to just looking at a diagram and follow the arrows. We won't write it down, just follow the arrows. That's the proof. 
And then you get to homological algebra and you have pages of the five lemmas, the snake lemmas, and stuff like that. It's the same. The usage of the language here is such that if you look at the diagram, you understand what you're doing. It's dynamic. You read it in a certain way. Just, oh, here's the proof. And you look at it and say, oh, yeah, sure, it's obvious. Okay? End of the proof. So here, these are very important that they're underlying the design. So the user is going to have that in mind and look at that. The object, one instance I have, the one I'm using here, is the properties of triangulated categories. So you have to have these objects, and you have to build it using the language with certain constraints. And this gives you the object you're actually building. And last, you want your object to be useful in a certain context. The original context is algebraic geometry. Of course, what happened afterwards is that people realized that these guys, like any tool, could be used in other contexts. And nowadays, triangulated categories are not only used in algebraic geometry, where they're fundamental, but also in analysis, in micro-local analysis, where they also are important and in representation theory of algebras. This was not intended, okay? But it's a different context in which, in which the form is used in a certain way. Right? So this is uh, these three properties are, are crucial to what I have in mind. So how is this form or this work a form of conceptual design? The triangulated categories uh, I have in mind here. As I said, the problems came with clear constraints. I told, I told you what the constraints were. And people knew about these constraints. Very clear. And the forms given by the axioms have specific and clear function. The axioms themselves are picked for that. And the means used, uh, in this case category theory, had a direct impact on the object and its usage, and that's the user. Now, as I said, I hope it is clear that the axioms are not thought about as being self-evident proposition. Right? This should be obvious and non-problematic, I think, to most of us, and given what Dirk has told us, it's sort of obvious. The axioms are chosen to fulfill a different purpose, they lay down what I call the basic principles of the design. That's how one would want to read. OK, here's how Verdier talks about triangulated categories. En résumé, il s'agit d'établir les fondements d'un formalisme avec tous les inconvénients que tel travail comporte. This is really strange. <laughs> he starts by saying, Wow, okay, I've done this, but oh, well, <laughs> sorry, these are, there are some inconveniences to what I've done. Please. Antimem et sorit, démonstration sans rien de difficulté mathématique, mais nécessitant des suites de vérification parfois, respectivement souvent, ennuyeuses. Ce travail ne présente donc un intérêt que dans la mesure où ce formalisme, par sa souplesse et sa généralité, permet la formulation et la démonstration the vrai So the English translation would be, uh, uh, in sum, what I want to do is establish the foundations of a formalism with all the inconvenience that uh, such a word uh, entails, antimems and sorats, uh, proofs without real mathematical difficulties, but requiring long verifications are very often boring. Uh, this work uh, has some interest in as much as the formalism by is a suppress. Well, you know what I mean. Uh, and if Jairadi uh, allows the formulation and the demonstration of real or true theorems. And in, in, the, in the thesis, he goes on by saying, oh, and here are the real theorems, the duality theorems. Now I can prove all these. I have a formalism. And that with all these, then, we can do all of this kind of stuff. Okay. And we'll, um, I should have said this. I'll say it now. Triangulated categories at first are really seen as a sort of a 
an in-between step between what you want to do. You start with the billion categories. Your goal is what is called derived categories. This is where homological algebra is really starting to take it off. And there's this thing in between, triangulated categories. And no one saw them coming, so not even what to do. But Veltier realized that they were powerful enough and, and flexible enough, supple enough, that they had the real interest and, and, and as a tool could allow you a way to prove all kinds of stuff okay, that were very interesting and useful. Right. So when axioms are used in the context of a conceptual design, then their choice reflects properties of the generic generic user in this context. That's pretty clear. All right. So what? The thing is, is that if you look at the literature on design, people thinking about design present it as a form of knowledge. Right? It's not just an activity, it's something that you know. There are good designers, there are bad designers. And there are people who do good things, and people who do bad things. And there are evaluations of the quality of design. But it's also emphasized very quickly that it's not the same as scientific knowledge. Okay, so hey, like the literature is not very clear. You might say, well, no one knows really what scientific knowledge anyway. <laughs> so what the hell? Perhaps it's uh, more complicated than we think. Well, all right, okay. This is how they usually put it. Um, here's a quote. The scientific method is a kind of problem-solving behavior employed in finding out the nature of what exists, whereas the design method is a pattern of behavior employed in inventing things of value that do not yet exist. Science is analytic. Design is constructive. But the main point here is, this is obvious, is that when you design, it's you think of something that you want to construct or build, that will be built or constructed, hopefully, and that will have certain functions. Okay? And so it's here where the descriptive and prescriptive aspects is somewhat coming in in the picture. Uh, and I think this is very uh, interesting to think of it. Think about it. Just here. Here's another book by Herbert Simon. Uh, who wrote a very, very interesting book in 1969 called The Science of the Artificial. Uh, very influential book in design theory. Uh, nowadays people think, eh, a science of design, no, not quite, perhaps it's something else. But he tried to do this. And it's a very fascinating book to read. Um, and then he, he suggests that even writing music is a form of design. Okay? And, and he says, I'm ready to defend this. And here's one long quote. Everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Well, if this is true, then don't you make certain of this design? The intellectual activity that produces material artifacts is no different fundamentally from the one that prescribes remedies for a sick patient or the one that devises a new sales plan for a company or social welfare policy for a state. Design so construed is the core of all professional training. It is the principal mark that distinguishes the professions from the sciences. So if you go to engineering school, you'll learn design. If you go to the physics department, well, you'll learn physics. But you won't learn design. Schools of engineering as well as schools of architecture, business, education, law, and medicine are all centrally concerned with the process of design. Okay. Again, how is it different from scientific knowledge? The activity of design also relies heavily on the skilled performance of the designer. This again is something which is openly and legitimately recognized in technology, but tends not to be in science. Of course, is the tends not to be is something that came up with Kuhn and all the others, where it's ah, we, we kind of forgot that in science too, you had these skills that were really important, particularly in the empirical sciences, in the lab and such and such. Well, in mathematics, the certainly of skills are at work. Um, and certainly when you look at the the, how people will justify the fields matters. 
very often in the declaration of a, a colleague will present the work of a, a field and will say, he had these skills at computing, thinking about, and, and so on and so forth. All right, so this is all. But the thing is here is that the products of design are artifacts. And this is where people say, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so mathematics is artifacts? But this, again, does not mean that they are arbitrary. And talk to an architect or an engineer and say, well, look, I can't do whatever I want. Of course not. If I were to try to do this, I would lose my job. I mean, clearly, I can do certain things. But it's not as if I could do whatever I want. There are artifacts that are very constrained. Right? Compare and contrast the work of artists with the work of designers. So if you're an artist, constraints, well, perhaps. You would like to build something like a stove. You'd like to wrap the, the whole Paris would be wrapped. <laughs> if I could do that, I would do it. Oh, okay, I don't have the money for that. People would, wouldn't like it. But it's not the same kind. A designer has, right from the start, specific functions, in it. perhaps even specific constraints where related to who's going to use it. In what environment? Environment. But nowadays, the environment is also constrained to provide constraints. Uh, here, of course, I can't, cannot help but thinking about Kampfer's claim that what characterizes the, math the mathematician is his freedom to create whatever he wants. Okay. Uh, clearly, this is, does not apply to what Kotenbeek is trying to do with all the constraints, very, very tight constraints, and the style that he's developing by doing such way he's working. So design is also associated with style. This is options, but also there are mathematical styles. And some who are more closer to constraints will work in a certain way. And others, and I've heard that from colleagues in mathematics saying, well, okay, look, we're trying to have this wonderful work, but he had this very narrow goal in mind. The constraints were so clear that it really led him to work in a certain way, with a certain style, although Mind you, people before working there were trying to prove the conjectures by looking at them and proving them, like any mathematician would. What Kotlin did is that he just reformulated the whole of homological algebra right from the start and then build up the theory of schemes and build up all these big theories, and then he got to, he got to where he wanted to. It's a different way of looking at it, a different way of conceiving what he wanted to do. Now, in this case, the role of categories in the design is very interesting, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and this is, I think, a, a crucial remark. In, in general, whether I'm wrong or right about this, I think this, is, this holds true in, at, at least as an analogy. So the categories involved, the beauty of the right triangulated, can be thought of as providing blueprints. Now, this is a, you have to, why do people think of category theory as a general abstract nonsense? Well, if you look at the, if you're an architect and you look at a, a plan, if you go on, it's very clear to you what the building would look like. If you look at the blueprint of an architect, if you haven't seen one before, you have no idea what's going on. But it gives you how to, it gives you the basic principles of how to build a building, what it will look like, what it will do, how people will live. And I claim that this is how the abstract character of category theory is exactly in the same way. Why? What do category gives you. In, in the case of, well, I'll, come, I'll get back to that. There are certain categorical concepts that occupy the center stage in these theories. If you look at the triangulated categories, if you look at the book by Neiman, for instance, there is a book, so there is a book on triangulated category, by the way. So if you look at that book, um, all, almost all of the theorems are involved by proving the existence of adjoint functions in the theory. So that's what they do. This is, this is one of the central concepts of category. A mathematician can use these blueprints, and this is related to what I've, I was saying here. So mathematicians can use these blueprints to construct specific contexts and obtain mathematical results. How? This is, this is golden yet. The theory of schemes is awfully abstract. But then you get to algebraic geometry. You have to specify the scheme you're working with, Hilbert schemes, and other kind, Picard schemes, and things like that. You get down on earth, so to speak. You put in some of the materials you're going to work with, and then you get the results you're interested in. 
So there's this level of this very general theory that provides you and gives you guidelines, results, constraints, and then if you're interested in certain results in algebraic geometry, specific results in this particular kind of space, varieties, then you use that, you put in the material you're working on, and then you get your results. This is how the conjectures were proved. So the building category is a very general theory, abstract theory. It gives you all the things you can do, certain aspects of things you can do in homological algebra. Then you specify the varieties you're working with, and you get down to the real thing. So the categories are seen here as providing you the guidelines of how do you go from here to there. Well, you go this way. And then if you are really to do it, you have to make sure that this is what you're talking about. You're plugging this particular field, this particular finite field, this particular variety, and then you have you prove the results in that context. And almost that. So, as I said, they provide the principles and constraints in the design process. And here is the analogy. In the same way that physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, and sociology provide laws and principles in the architectural design process, category theory provides you with principles that constrain your process. And nowadays, most mathematicians, I mean, in algebraic geometry and algebraic topology, at the very least, this is clear. People have assumed that now. And it's, yeah. All right. Before anyone raises his hand and says, well, look, <laughs> there's no objection that everybody wants to do, I'm sure. To the project I'm presenting, of course, say, well, look, there's no epistemology of design. If you look, if you Google now, <laughs> epistemology of design, you'll probably find one thing do it. But it's probably useless, OK? It's totally useless. Uh, and the fact is, people, when they think about the epistemology of design, you think about the embodied cognition. Okay? They are really in the material of things, the materials that guide the design. Uh, here is the analogy, it's not exactly what we want. Um, you might say, look, the notion of conceptual design is more obscure than what it is trying to explain. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about this. Um, I think that, in fact, what we ought to do is to clarify the notion of design using what we're doing here. Right? Again, as we always say, when people ask us, why are you doing philosophy in that? OK, math is interesting. But also, math provides clear cases where philosophy can be put to test and have real answers. Okay. Well, I think here's the same idea that if I'm right, and I've tried to do that, I'm not sure it will work, we can use that to clarify the notion of design itself in general, see if it works, and might, might lead to an epistemology of design, or a part of it that is just not, not existent right now. <coughs> OK, let me open up a little bit. If you start thinking about this way, about mm -hmm. mathematics this way, then you start thinking about, oh, perhaps design is also there more than you think. Uh, one of the potential examples of designers is our fonts and what you do with fonts. Uh, and someone who, want, who wants to introduce design, somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about, usually does just that. So says, look, I'll write down a word, the same word, but different fonts. And you'll see how the variation in the fonts will change the emotions you'll have of the word you read. Okay. And that's a classical way of introducing what design is. Uh, in mathematics, we all know that notational systems are crucial. And people spend a whole lot of time thinking about that. But it's how they will write down things. It makes a huge difference. No? That's a good sense. Visual aids. Diagrams, as I said, played a crucial role in development of categories. Again, the way you use that, and whether you're sensitive to that or not, because people are more or less sensitive to designs, is also a case where you can use that and actually perhaps get results. Algorithms are 
are used for certain specific purposes and you think about the way you have to get this result by a certain algorithm, you might introduce certain notions of design in the way the algorithm is thought about. Maybe more. Right? And last, but not least, if you think about design, you think about beauty. Every designer wants to build a beautiful thing. Mathematicians are very, well, not all of them, but some of them are very, very sensitive to, math, to beauty in mathematics. What is beauty in mathematics is still a philosophical mystery, very interesting topic. I will just end with one quote, and I have to end with a quote by Hawking. That is what Hawking did have to say. Sans un minimum d'ouverture à la beauté des choses, j'aurais été bien incapable de fonctionner comme mathématicien. Même à un régime des plus modestes, which was not the case. <laughs> He used to work 16 hours a day, like mad. Et je doute que quiconque puisse faire un travail utile en mathématiques, s'il ne reste vivant en lui, tant soit peu, ce sens de la bonté. Le travail le plus profond, le plus fécond, est celui qui atteste de la sensibilité la plus déliée pour appréhender la beauté cachée. And I won't translate that. <laughs> and I will end with this. Thank you. Uh, ten minutes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. They asked me a lot for the job that I will give uh, later. Oh, so cool. thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> But I, I have a question that, so I'm totally with you, but I, I have a question that is a question that for me is dangerous, which is, okay, let's take that it's designed, so you have a plan in engineering and you have a building corresponding to it. You have something in chemistry that could be three-dimensional, three-dimensional, or whatever, but there is something that, of course, the, the connection with the reality is kind of more problematic, but still there is some. But what happens in mathematics when you have a notation, when you have that beautiful diagram that you show? Uh, what's the object? Is there an object? Uh, there is no object. Uh, we are constructing objects. Uh. Well, I think uh, that's a good question. Um, I think we are. Okay, let me step back. I'm not making the claim that everything is designed. Yeah. I just use one example, one particular case of axioms used in that purpose. I'm not saying that's always the case, I'm saying that we have also this. In this particular case, then I would claim we're, we're building something, object theory, however you want to call it. Uh, we're designing something that's going to be used through, uh, through certain means. The means are certain languages, certain formalism, and the actions are using uh, playing a key role. That's not all. I mean, we're, we're, I think one thing, one of the things that I want to emphasize here is, is that I, I'm not saying that there's not a scientific aspect to mathematics also. I think mathematics is very rich. Uh, so much so that this might be one aspect of it, but not all of it. Okay. So in this particular case, in the case of triangulated categories, for instance, I would claim that, hey, look, we're, we're, we're really, they really designed something. A theory with a certain purpose in mind, and it turns out that it is a wonderful tool that is used nowadays. So, but in general, well, in general, it, it, it varies a lot. But, but in some cases, we have to be aware that what you're doing is designed. If we consider the distinction between design and the field of design, we evaluate the title of your presentation is axiomatic axiomatization as conceptual design. Right. Or it is as real realization of a conceptual design. But there is a okay, okay. You're right. <laughs> sure. I stand for it. Marco? So, in consonant with the, your last slide, I would say beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, then, but, oh, but then, yeah, a I, no, but not, not, there is not really a but. Since I have a word, a, 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 a question. The question is the following. 
under this interpretation of actually, I understand that is not an interpretation that you wanted to apply to any no. maximization of mathematics, no. but take this particular case. Okay. Under this interpretation, what's the difference uh, real between that and uh, a philosophical theory? It's not a design instance, also, for, instance, for example, I don't know, uh, sorry, the theory of reference, or the, the theory of Cartesian theory of mind, well, look, or uh, Kant, uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, I don't know, what's the difference? Really? Well, there's what? the obvious answer, Marco. We want to be right, or we want to be true in case of philosophical. That's mm -hmm. what we want to do. Well, in the case of Verzi, he didn't want to have the, the truth, whatever that means. He needed something that was a formalism that would allow him to get these results, to build these cohomology theories, to make the derived categories the right kind of categories where you could do homological logic. Mm. That's not what a philosopher wants to do. Is that what I want? Sorry, but yes, I, I, I understand that you think this way, but it is not what the, the, the picture that you propose here uh, does not mandate to think this way because perfectly compatible with a sort of Platonist conception. So in this sense, uh, it is simply not a, only a tool, but you want to grasp the truth of some mathematical universe. You can have this point, this, or, or, this attitude, or not. Okay, okay. But uh, uh, there is nothing what you say that, that excludes that is attitude. I forgot some of the quotes I wanted to put yeah. here. You should also know that when triangulated categories were proposed, there were the, 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 the pitfalls, yeah. the, the faults, the problems with them were really pointed out. Even to this day, people. Well, if you talk to a specialist about triangulated categories, oh, yeah, they're, they're great, they're great, but they're not exactly what we want because we can't do this with them. And the other is really aware. Derived that was a problem. Derived categories, the way Hodgkin de defined them at first, just didn't work. So, ah, shoot, it doesn't do. It doesn't work. So you have to fill around, and there are some limitations, and you have to change this and build that. And now, the beauty of this, this is really a surprise. When I talked earlier about this uh, language here, so this is the language of category theory. Now what people are realizing right now is that if you forget about category theory, but you go to higher dimensional categories, then some of the notions you realize suddenly are universal. Woo! And these are suddenly said, whoa, so this is what we were looking for. It, that's why it didn't work. We we're looking at a flat picture. We need to have the whole picture. Okay, so I think there's a real difference here. Because of the, of, of the way it is evaluated, the point here, the way it is evaluated is not, oh, it's true. It's, it doesn't work. It's not doing what it ought to be doing. Okay. Right. You know, all right, garbage. Start again. There are two last questions. Uh, yeah, your money is probably just to blow up of Marcus' questions. There's a, there's a philosophical theory of math, uh, a family of philosophical theories of mathematics where there is the same contrast that you have in your theory between, on the one side, some sort of freedom of invention and the other side, some constraints posed by context, whatever, or whatever right. which is fictionalism. And my question would just be whether you can clarify what's the difference between your my position, position and fictionalism. If Mark is right and your position is my short answer consistent is with that, Platon. Okay, I'll be very blunt. Right. I don't think fictionalism works. You don't think that fictionalism works. And the long answer is I think Robert Thomas wrote very nice papers on this. Right. It's like, well, here again, here's the thing. It's the same problem as mine. Either you're making an analogy. Are you really making a real play? Okay. I think the analogy is very helpful. Interesting. Ties you towards certain things, but you forget about other things about fictions that doesn't apply at all. And just ignore them. Okay, for your analogy to work. Which is an analogy. This is what you do. The real theory, I haven't seen it yet. And you want a general theory of fictions that will work? I don't think it works. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for a stimulating talk. Uh, there's one question I had, and shame I would make to make. Me. The question there is design has to take into account certain properties, and you mentioned the different properties of users. Yeah. And cognitive constraints were a crucial feature. Yeah. What do you have in mind about cognitive constraints? Okay, uh, that's one thing. Okay, to be totally honest with you, I'm thinking about. 
<laughs> I still have to think more carefully about that. But uh, what I have in mind is the work done now by cognitive psychologists who work in mathematics, and, and really the real cognitive constraints that we people have and others seem not to have. I think of office statistics people or people who can compute things like that that I can't do with these that's it. Um, I'm not quite sure what to answer about this at this moment. Okay? But I, I put it there because I think it has to be taken into account. If, it, 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 only because if you think about this as a form of design, you have to. Okay? The claim is, is this. Lidikens work in the same design design is conceptually designed. Oh, I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I didn't think about this, but I, I'll have to take it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>